Back after the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, this is CNN Student News. We've got a bit of history coming up. First though, a nasty ice storm in the U.S. Northeast. The mayor of Danbury, Connecticut called it Icezilla. Freezing rain glazed parts of the region over the weekend. It made driving extremely dangerous. Some highways had to be closed. One pileup in Pennsylvania involved 60 cars and trucks. One person was killed in the wreck and 30 were hurt. It was just a big load of cars, a lot of mayhem and chaos going on. It's horrible. It's horrible, man. I've been sitting out here since 7, 7.30. Several other people died in road accidents. Conditions were treacherous from Connecticut to Maine, much of it caused by black ice, when a thin, often invisible layer freezes over roads. It caused a pileup on the West Coast as well, involving dozens of vehicles on Interstate 84 in Oregon. There was an incredible story of survival, though. As his pickup was crushed between two tractor trailers, Caleb Whitby said he just closed his eyes and prayed. Whitby walked away from this with only a bruise and some scratches. After hearing stories like that and remembering the brutal cold of last winter, it might be hard to believe that 2014 was the warmest year recorded since 1880. That's when scientists started keeping records and the U.S. government says the average temperatures over land and seas were a fraction higher than ever by seven hundredths of one degree Fahrenheit. The report said this didn't really have an impact on snow in the northern hemisphere. It said snow cover for 2014 was about average despite the slightly warmer overall temperature. In what field did Martin Luther King Jr. earn his doctorate? If you think you know it, shout it out. Was it philosophy, English, education or theology? You've got three seconds. Go. In 1955, Martin Luther King earned a PhD in systematic theology at Boston University. That's your answer and that's your shout out. Martin Luther King's birthday was last Thursday, January 15th. But since 1986, it's been celebrated as a U.S. federal holiday on the third Monday in January, which was yesterday. Marches, speeches, and parades are all part of the event. Demonstrators turned out in some cities to draw attention to the controversial police killings we covered last year. The holiday is also known as the MLK Day of Service. Dr. King once said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? In that spirit, participants are encouraged to volunteer as a way to honor him. CNN's Natisha Lance recently visited the Center for Civil and Human Rights. She gives us a sense of the national climate when Dr. King rose to the forefront of the civil rights movement. So in the 1950s, you also had the death of Emmett Till and how that really sparked the civil rights movement because people were outraged that this young black boy was killed for allegations that were untrue and false and, and his murder being so unjust and so brutal at the time. Till's death pushed King and others to develop more unified strategies of protest. That included the bus boycotts and the lunch counter sit-ins across the South. And so we have the Greensboro sit-in at the Woolworth lunch counter um, and that's in the 1960s where students at North Carolina A&T um, sat down at white only counters to protest the segregation that was taking place there. Sit-ins like these were conducted by college students. They endured racial slurs and physical violence just for the right to sit at the whites only counters. The sit-in movement was a precursor to the March on Washington. The march inspired many with its peaceful show of solidarity and amazing speeches. But its leaders wanted more. What was the strategy behind it? What were they fighting for? What specifically did they want? So the March on Washington was all about jobs and freedom and equality. Um, and what a lot of people don't know is that there were a set of 10 demands that were created um, and that were drafted up um, that, were, that the protesters wanted to achieve. He shall from time to time give to the Congress information of the State of the Union. That's one thing the U.S. Constitution requires of the President and President Obama is scheduled to fulfill that requirement tonight. The address starts at 9 p.m. Eastern. You can watch it live on CNN. It's followed by the Republican response, which will be given this year by Senator Joni Ernst. The timing, the fact that it's televised, the opposing party's response, 
None of that's required by the Constitution. What we see each year is mostly American tradition. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Vice President. Distinguished members of the United States Congress. Members of the Supreme Court. Distinguished guests. My fellow Americans. I can report to you. The State of the Union is strong. Think for a minute how far we have come in 200 years. We find ourselves challenged by new problems in this country, at home, and abroad. There is demanded of us vigilance, determination, and dedication. We must rise to make a nation better than any we have ever known. For well, the road has been long, the burden heavy, and the pace urgent. This is not going to be easy. We have only begun. Let us have the will and the patience to do this job together. We need many different kinds of strength. Military, economic, political, and moral. Nothing is impossible. No For victory is beyond our reach. No glory will ever be too great. We are Americans part of something larger than ourselves. God bless you and God bless the United States of America. America. Thank you very much. First two schools mentioned today are from Washington State and Massachusetts. Why? Because of the Super Bowl. Callis Junior High School is in Puyallup, Washington. It's the home of the Tyees, first time we've had that mascot. We've mentioned some cougars before, but never the ones from Natick, Massachusetts. These cats are from John F. Kennedy Middle School. And in Hunter, North Dakota, good to see the Jaguars. They're at Northern Cass School and they round out today's roll. We told you last week how the Falcon 9 rocket that recently carried a private capsule into space didn't land as it should have. Turns out one of the rocket's fins ran out of hydraulic fluid. That caused it to descend at about a 45 degree angle, explode on impact, and fire debris out into the Atlantic Ocean where the landing pad was located. The rocket did reach its target. SpaceX is planning to try again. Reusable rockets would save the company a fortune. The rocket also got the Dragon space capsule into orbit. It successfully docked with the International Space Station last week. One item it brought to astronauts? Mustard. They'd run out of condiments. But there were even more random items aboard. More than 5,000 pounds of equipment was just sent to the International Space Station. And while most of it was normal stuff like food, equipment, even Christmas presents for the astronauts, some unusual items also hitched a ride to space. And lift off of the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket with Dragon. Fruit flies, those pesky bugs that drive you insane and seem to be just about everywhere, are now even in space. Apparently, the immune systems of the common fruit fly are similar to those of humans. By studying how fruit flies' immune systems respond to space flight, scientists hope to understand how microgravity environments affect our own bodies. Flatworms are now also in space. They are able to regenerate their own cells as they age or become damaged. Scientists want to see how this self-healing mechanism operates in microgravity to understand how wounds heal in space. And roundworms. Scientists will be testing how roundworms respond to the salmonella virus. They hope to better understand how humans are susceptible to getting infections while in orbit. Now, not all things that were sent up were creepy and crawly. There was also an IMAX movie camera. Let's hope that footage is in 3D. This isn't the first time odd items have been sent to space. Astronauts are able to make requests and also bring personal items with them. Legos, fruitcakes, even props for a YouTube video have experienced constant freefall. Is it weird that I'm kind of jealous of a fruitcake? Never a good idea for a security guard to fall asleep on the job, but when that happens at a zoo, there can be trouble afoot. What we've got here is failure to keep three rhinos in the safari area of an Israeli zoo. They made it all the way out to the parking lot before some other workers were able to corral the beasts and bring them back to their habitat. The guard lost his job. The rhinos? That's harder to say. Maybe they thought a good run would be tons of fun. Maybe they just wanted to go shopping at Rhinoceros. After that feat of hoofing it though, will zoo capers let that happen again? There's Rhino Way, y'all. I'm Carl Azu, CNN Student News is charging back your way tomorrow.